Hi, and welcome to Living Life. I'm so glad that you decided to come by, and I pray that the Word of God will light your path and walk with you as He sees you as a child of God. You know, one of the movies that I really enjoy watching was called uh, Remember the Titans, and it's a football story about how one town uh, during the time of civil rights when uh, the, there was segregation between the blacks and the whites and they were starting to come together for the very first time. And one of the scenes that they focused on was on high school football. And, you know, until then they had played separately. You know, the white uh, players would play on one side and the black players would play on the other. Uh, but this town decided to integrate the two and they would install a, a black head coach. And with that, he also had to, they asked one of the, the white coaches to become the defensive coordinator. And at first he resisted because uh, they had never worked together and there's still a lot of animosity between the two sides. Well, the two had to learn to work together, not only as coaches, but also for the players. Uh, but that's one of the, the beauty about sports is that uh, you learn to work together and become a family. And it's a historic uh, uh, story talking about how they went on to overcome the circumstances and they went on to win the championship and they became one team. And in a similar fashion, we'll be looking in this passage of how that there's a difference between the Jews and the Gentiles and how they are starting to come together all because God had ordained it. This was his plan to bring the two together and Peter would play an important role uh, for this season. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. In the book of Acts, I, I really enjoy this book because it gives me great excitement to see how God is stirring, God is working through the people, and He's also building up uh, the church. And in this particular passage, in this scene, uh, we see how God is speaking uh, through His servant Cornelius, uh, a Gentile, a man who is not of Jewish descent, uh, but rather a Gentile. And it begins with his vision. And as this chapter begins, we get an introduction of this character named Cornelius. And we are told that he was a, a centurion, which means that he oversaw a hundred soldiers that were under his command. 
Now you see that he had authority, he had power, he had position uh, from the very beginning. And in the New Testament, there are quite a few centurions uh, who had a, a very a positive impact uh, in the Bible, especially in the, in the New Testament. You know, the, the first Gentile that Jesus ministered to was a centurion, and he also was known for his faith. And later on at the cross, at the death of Christ, there was a centurion who proclaimed and confessed that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, I don't know if it was a coincidence, but it seems like there were a pocket full of, of faithful centurions who served and loved the Lord. And we find out that it's given to us, shared with us, that uh, Cornelius was a devout man um, of, of the faith, and his household also uh, feared God. Now, some commentators debate on whether or not he truly believed in God, if he had truly given his life uh, to the Lord. But based on this passage, based on in the information that we received, uh, I firmly believe that he was a man of faith, a man who really not only feared God, but he loved him and, and served him with his life. And we can see that uh, based on, we also see that he was very generous with his giving, that uh, his finances he considered not just his own, but it was something that was meant to be shared. And we see that he would give to people in need all around. And as a result, uh, he was known for his faith. He was known as a, a man who really loved people and wanted to help them uh, and, and not just um, felt entitled because of his power and his position. And so I really firmly believe that he was a man, uh, a man of God. And everyone knew about him. Uh, and he was a living testimony of how God was using him. Now, we don't know how he came to faith, um, but we are encouraged to see that uh, he was used to really bring forth the gospel to the Gentile crowd, the Gentile community uh, at this time. And so uh, you, we know that it was you know, uncommon for Gentiles to come to faith. And so it, it's very curious to see uh, how all this happened. But all we do know is that God was going to use this man uh, to bring up forth a revival, a huge change in tide in terms of allowing these people into the presence of God. And so uh, in his time of devotion, we see that the angel speaks to him. And his reaction to the angel is very much like a lot of the faithful servants that we see who encounter angels in the Bible. And we see that he was faithful to God and he asked, you know, the Lord, what do you want me to do for you? And then later on, we see in the scene uh, Peter's vision. So God is working not only through Cornelius, but also through Peter so that they two can sync up uh, together. And so Peter plays an important role, too, in terms of speaking the gospel message. And Jesus would, told Peter that through him that he would build up the church. And so this vision that Peter receives, uh, he sees both unclean and clean animals coming together. Now, as a devout Jew, he knew that any unclean animal was something that he was told to stay away from. This was not something to take lightly. And, and therefore, there were laws, there were certain regulations they were, they were told to follow. And we would see that in the Old Testament, uh, in Leviticus, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, shows them guidelines of how to treat animals uh, of this kind of nature. And so when Peter sees this vision, when he sees the unclean and, un and clean animals coming together, he was disgusted by that. Uh, but God was telling him not to be because God is the one who claims whether an animal is clean or unclean. And this was an image he was trying to show him that he is bringing the Jews and the Gentiles together. That the Jews who are considered clean and the Gentiles who are considered unclean, uh, God was bringing a plan to have them to be as one. And so this is an uh, amazing picture and a start of a change 
uh, of how the gospel is going to be spread. And this is going to be used in a mighty way uh, so that us, all of us listening, can be recipients of the gospel as well. It's pretty amazing how the paths of Cornelius and Peter intersect. And, you know, a lot of times there may be people in our lives that we never gave a second thought towards. And I'm sure for Peter, he never saw Cornelius as an opportunity to share the gospel or to see what God had in store for him. And so as we conclude, as we prayerfully learn to apply uh, this passage into our lives. I, I want us to consider, you know, maybe there are people in our lives that we are not aware of. Maybe there are people that we run into uh, every single day, whether at school or at work or even in our commute. Maybe as we're walking, uh, there are maybe vendors that you see or at coffee shops uh, that maybe God is tugging on their hearts and your hearts and that God wants to bring together. And so I want us to make it our prayer in, in saying, uh, God, help me to be aware of how I can be used as an instrument, how I can be used to share the good news of the gospel that was given to me that is meant to be shared uh, with those around us. And so um, like Cornelius and like Peter, uh, maybe God is using us to bring people uh, into our lives. Let's pray for that. Father, we thank you for revealing, God, how you used in a mighty way both Cornelius and Peter, people who were faithful, uh, God, to loving and serving you. And through them, you were able to bring the gospel uh, to many nations. I pray, God, that we would keep that in mind and prayerfully consider uh, how we can share, how we can give, and how we can be a part in other people's lives as well. Thank you for showing us and revealing this amazing truth to us. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.